Wonder Woman is emasculating men, taking away their manhood by defeating them in battle. Or, that's what the villain of today's series would want you to think. You see, the entire United States has turned against Amazons, and Wonder Woman fighting against the US Army against their wishes is leading to our villain making up a few things about Wonder Woman. This story is written by Tom King, and today we're going to bring you the first four issues diving into this mystery. And it's very good. I find this book very interesting. But you're at Comic Storian, where we take audio dramas of your favorite comic books. I read them out to you narratively so you know what's going on in the world of comics and what to add to your collection. If you want to see more books like this, join us over at Patreon to get early access and a ton of exclusive content. All right, let's get into Wonder Woman, issue one. It was a snowy night in Montana. Kanger's Cues was full of people having a good time. A tall blonde woman was playing pool with a group of men, but someone touched somewhere they weren't supposed to. Words were exchanged. Words turned into blows. One man was shoved face first through a table. His cousin rushed to the woman, swinging a pool cue at her that broke in half across her face. She didn't even blink. With lightning fast reflexes, the woman reached out, grabbing the man by the throat. She easily lifts him into the air, turning at the gathering of men that have surrounded her preparing for a fight. The snow continues to fall outside. The next day and several weeks afterwards, the newscasters report the scene of the fight. There were 19 men murdered in the fight. The only survivors were the three women inside. Word comes out that a blonde woman was an Amazon warrior. The Amazonian embassy reports that the woman was acting on her own and is searching for her, though the US government has deemed this an act of terrorism against the country with several news outlets fear-mongering and reporting that this is a direct attack on a men by the Amazon nation. Elsewhere in the country, Sergeant Steele sits across the table from the spies that he has been embedded with undercover. But his phone buzzes and he glances at it with a sigh. Ah, crap. He whispers as he looks up at the men, apologizing for have wasted their time. I'm sorry to do it, but I'm going to level with you here. He says, removing his black glove, revealing the robotic hand underneath. The two spies stare in shock as Steele explains that he is undercover and that he was going to get everything that he could from them before killing them off. But he shakes his head, motioning to his phone. I had this whole plan. It was going to take months, but I just got a text. They say that I'm to report ASAP to lead a new task force to deal with this big lady you probably heard about on the TV. So I suppose I need to adjust my strategy some. He says before pointing his metallic hand at the spies and firing two rounds from the fingertips killing them both. Steele stands and casually walks out, apologizing to the rest of the people in the restaurant as he passes them. Elsewhere, Diana and Steve walk through the rain in the front of the Washington Monument. He warns her about Steele's involvement, telling her that the country is going to come down hard on the Amazons. It's just confusion. I can stop it, Steve. Diana tells him, but she looks at the man that she's trusted and more for some time. If they call for help, Steve, will you go? Diana asks him, but we don't get an answer. Because time passes, and the Amazons are deported out of the country. Those that refuse are arrested and forced out, or worse. Steele knocks on a door in the small house in the suburbs, and a woman answers. Her eyes widen at the full SWAT team at Steele's back, and he smiles, informing her that he is there to remove the woman and her wife from the country. I'd appreciate it if you'd choose to come with us in a polite and obedient fashion, he tells her. Inside, there's a young girl playing with her toys, unaware of the officer at her window, and the gun pointed directly at her. The woman looks at Steele. We have a daughter. She was born here. She goes to school here. We're looking into ways to stay. We're talking to a lawyer right now, the woman says, and Steele continues to smile, promising that their daughter will be taken care of, assuring her that the girl will be brought to a comfortable environment. If you have any questions about that, you're free to contact the government once you leave U.S. territory, Steele says. The officer watches the young girl play, unaware of the Amazon warrior that is behind him. The woman brings her shield up and back down on the officer's head. Blood flies through the air. In moments, she is rushing around the corner, bellowing a war cry as she charges at the assault team. Gunfire erupts, rounds chew through Amazonian steel. It rips through her body. Aw, oh, ain't that a shame? Steele says with a shake of his head. More time passes and more Amazons are arrested and killed in the ensuing weeks. Back on Themyscira, 
Queen Nubia speaks with her ambassadors about the whereabouts of Diana, but Wonder Woman is refusing to leave America, instead sending her sword back in her place with the response of, And what I now do, I must avoid temptation. Weeks pass into months. The country is on edge. In Montana, Sergeant Steele walks through the cemetery, snow crunching beneath his shoes, the assault team at his back moving slowly behind him, weapons at the ready. You know, girl, you shouldn't be here, Steele says to the kneeling woman before him, and Diana looks up. I was near. I hoped to give my prayers, she says, and he shakes his head, offering a smile. First you kill them, then you pray over them. I respect that. Still, don't make it right. Diana shakes her head, reminding Steele that she did not kill those men in Montana. But she intends to find out why her Amazon sister did. That is why I'm here in Montana. There are lies here. Diana says quietly. Steele finally has had enough, ordering Diana to give up and allow his men to take her into custody. But once again, she shakes her head. No thank you. In the distance, a sniper takes aim through his scope, preparing to fire. He doesn't wait for the orders and he squeezes the trigger. The round rips through the air, but Diana is faster, turning and bringing up her bracelet. She deflects the round away. You don't want this! Steel snaps, but Diana is already moving, unraveling her lasso and leaping amongst the kill team. The lasso wraps around two members, slamming them together. The rest open fire, but Diana easily deflects the rounds before tossing her tiara at them. Knocking them both out, she moves fast, powerful muscles propelling her through the team, lashing out, taking them down in moments. She steps through the fallen team towards Steel. Let us talk, she says simply. But that sniper, he's about to take another shot. Diana throws her lasso, bringing him down out of the tree. I'm doing what you failed to do. I'm looking for Emily. The woman who has killed the men. I'm going to find out why she has done such a horrible thing. Steel shrugs, not really caring, as that's not his mission. But Steel reminds her that she openly attacked his men, and now Wonder Woman is in big trouble. You shot me before I moved. Why are you lying? But Steel shakes his head. Got no idea what you mean. I came here with all my men, and you got aggressive. Steel tells her. Diana looks down at the sniper, demanding to know why he fired, and the man struggles against the lasso of truth, but admits he was following orders. Interesting. I wonder what you'll say when I wrap this lasso around you, Sergeant Steele, Diana says, but Steele doesn't wait, lashing out with his robotic hand. Diana easily catches it, crushing it in her grasp. He falls to his knees, and Diana moves forward with her lasso, preparing to get answers. Sometime later, she meets with Trevor in front of the Washington Monument. He warns her that this will escalate the government's response to the Amazons, but asks what information she got from Steele. He did not have much to say. He was only following orders. He did not know about Emily or where she was or why she did it. He says he was just doing what he was told. Diana tells Steve and they stop as she looks at him. The only interesting thing that he had to say was when I asked him who was giving these orders. He said it was all from a man he had never met and knew very little about. Steve, have you heard of anyone called the Sovereign? Meanwhile, in a secret palace somewhere in America, the true ruler of the country sits on his throne, a crown of gold on his head, and the lasso lies in his hands. The King of America. Some time passes, and somewhere in America, Diana walks across the landscape that will soon become a battlefield. She stands before Trevor, now in full uniform. They sent you? She asks quietly, and Steve nods at sadness in his eyes. Sergeant Steele knows we got past. They think I can put some sense into you. Diana nods, putting a hand on Steve's shoulder. I will do all I can, but these boys will get hurt. It's not good. I do not want it. Tell Sergeant Steele to go home. Be happy with his family. Diana offers, but Steve knows that Steele will never do this. We then cut to the past. A young, masked Diana stands in the gladiatorial arena of Themyscira. She had made it to the final bout, and another warrior had asked her to yield, but Diana refused. In the present, Steve tried his best, but he knows that there is no swaying Diana once she has made up her mind. So he turns, walking back towards the military lines, and Steele is waiting, smoking a cigar and smiling. He knew Diana wouldn't surrender. All right, let's get this over and done with. I have a dinner with the POTUS in an hour. I'd like to get in a shower first. Give the order, Colonel, by the book. It starts with the artillery opening up first, bombing the area around Diana. Jets blaze overhead, dropping bombs out of the sky, and when the smoke clears, 
Well, we cut to the past. Young Diana survived Gladiator's first assault, ignoring her wounds and pushing the warrior woman away. Back in the present, the tanks are sent in next. They roll forward, opening fire, but Diana avoids the rounds, grabbing a tank by its gun, lifting it into the air and smashing it down with another tank nearby. But our past story, Diana still refuses to surrender, trading blows with the gladiator. But the woman is skilled, driving young Diana against the wall, driving her blade through her stomach. Back in the present, the infantry is sent in next. The soldiers move forward in a firing line, opening fire with their rifles. But Diana is fast, her hands moving at lightning speed, blocking the rounds with her bracelets. Finally, she whips her lasso back, grabbing one of the tanks and bringing it forward, swinging it through the air and sending it crashing to the ground, breaking up the infantry lines. I do not wish to harm you, but if you proceed, I will drop a 55-ton Abrams tank on your pathetic heads. Diana bellows at the soldiers, but the soldiers know that they are beat and turn, retreating back towards their lines, bringing shouts of anger from Steel as Steve Trevor watches with a smile. In the past... The young Diana still refuses to give up, pulling the sword out of her stomach and taking a hold of it. She is now armed with two swords charging forward, pressing the blades against the gladiator's throat, demanding her surrender. The Amazon gladiator finally relents, offering Diana the victory. She removes her helmet, revealing the blonde hair and offering Diana her name. Emily, she says quietly. Time passes. Somewhere in America, Diana walks into the offices of Southside Defense Industries, which she knows is really the secret headquarters of the Amazon extradition entity, also known as Axe. Excuse me, I'm looking for the office of Mr. Sergeant Steele. Do you have that number, please? Diana asks the front desk man, who doesn't even bother looking up from his crossword puzzle, telling her that she has the wrong building. Despite your silly facade, this is the headquarters of the classified organization Axe, which Mr. Steele heads. If you would kindly direct me to his office, I would be most grateful. Thank you. Diana says the man looks up from his crossword and is shocked to see Wonder Woman standing in front of him, and she smiles at him. Mr. Sergeant Steele. His office. The number, please. And the man finally nods. Uh, th th 32A, ma'am. He whispers. She turns to walk towards the elevators. Thank you she says over her shoulder. Meanwhile, the Sovereign meets a young Marine in his home. Private Delgado is amazed by the history and antiques that the Sovereign has acquired throughout his family's secret reign of the country. The old ruler smiles, pouring himself a drink, explaining some of the history behind the pieces, how his grandfather gave John Wilkes Booth the gun that was used to kill Lincoln. Meanwhile, Diana rides the elevator to the 32nd floor on the office building. A tactical team is waiting for her when the doors open, but her tiara is the first out the door, spinning and bouncing down the hallway, hitting the soldiers, seemingly moving on its own. Finally, the last soldier falls and Diana steps out of the elevator, looking at the unconscious men around her. Excuse me, does anyone know where number 32A is? Anyone? Don't worry, I'll find it, she says as she steps over their bodies, continuing down the hallway. Back in the Sovereign's home, Private Delgado is marveling at the nightstick that was taken from an officer during protests in the 60s. The king smiles at it fondly, explaining that his father would use it to deliver spankings. He puts the nightstick back and asks Private Delgado if the battle against Wonder Woman was traumatizing for him. But Delgado shrugs. I mean, she's a superhero. We lost. Fight another day. Get another paycheck. Not like I'm going to cry about it, he says. And the king smiles, nodding at him. He turns away, beckoning for Delgado to follow. Son, can we show you something else in our collection, something incomparable? The Sovereign says, and he leads Delgado to a drawer where he pulls out a dark, glowing lasso, explaining that this is the real secret of the family's rule in America. He holds out the lasso to the smiling man. Come here, soldier, please. To experience this exceptional object, we too must hold it together. Back at the headquarters of Axe, Diana now stands in Steele's office, his personal security and door are lying destroyed on the floor. I heard you had a very good break in the Emily case, something important. I know I might have snuck around here and there, tried to steal information from you, but all of that seemed so rude to me. No, I felt it was good to come here and talk. Diana says from behind Steele's desk, the soldier glaring at her as he aims his service weapon, and Diana smiles. It's better to be polite. Back at the Sovereign's house, Private Delgado takes a hold of the Lasso of Lies. His mind immediately opened to suggestion, and the king looks at him. It occurs to us that you may have been mistaken, son. 
Your tussle with Wonder Woman was highly onerous on you. Perhaps even devastating. The old man says, and Delgado stares at him, realizing the truth in the words. The ideas burrow their way into his mind, changing how he remembered the events. Oh, yes, sir. That is true. I felt devastated. The sovereign smiles, explaining that losing to an Amazon robbed him of the very thing that makes him a man. Delgado nods. Yeah, totally. I, I don't feel like I was a man anymore. She took that from me. The sovereign continues to smile. It is an ideal, but the only thing you can do in this situation is tell everyone what has happened, and then find a quick way to end your agony. Back in Steele's office, the soldier continues to aim his pistol, informing Diana that he has an army gathering in the streets below. As soon as I got here, I called every agency in Washington, anyone with some men and guns. He motions to the door, informing her that they are sending the team that is designed to stop Superman. You're just Wonder Woman, and downstairs is enough firepower to easily bring down the Justice League. Steel snaps, but Diana ignores him, standing and going to the window, looking out over the city. You have told Steve Trevor that you have a new lead on Emily. I wish to know what it is. What have you discovered? What is so important that you had to leak to Steve that you knew it? She asks, but Steele doesn't answer, continuing to wave his pistol, shouting at Diana, reminding her that he has an army. Wonder Woman finally sighs, looking back to her shoulder. Yes, Mr. Steele, you have an army, and I have an invisible jet, which is unknown to Steele as it hovers outside the window. Steele finally sits down at his desk, pulling out the file that he has kept, putting down his pistol and lighting a cigar. After our talk at the cemetery, you said that you were researching the Emily case. I decided to put some looks into it as well. He tells her that he had a team look at the crime scene who found something the police missed. A drop of the Amazon's blood. Your girl, your killer, she's got a little Amazon in her belly. Steele says with a smile. Meanwhile, Private Delgado returns to his home and he can't stop thinking about what Sovereign said. How he was truly traumatized by the defeat at the hands of Wonder Woman. How it has affected him as a man. He writes his note telling the world how he feels. And with this done, he puts the revolver to his forehead pulling the trigger. The news of Private Delgado's suicide spreads throughout the country, with most news sources putting the blame on Wonder Woman and the Amazon crisis as a whole. And while some of the country has turned on Wonder Woman following the event, others still consider her a hero, especially one little boy, one who considers Wonder Woman his favorite hero. Although the parents have misgivings, Diana travels to their home, where young Jack is dying of cancer. But his wish is to spend the day with his favorite hero, and Diana is going to give the boy his wish. The boy wakes up in his bed to find the Amazon smiling by his side. Wonder Woman! He shouts with joy, and she smiles back at him. Hello, Jack. I'm happy to meet you, she tells him. Meanwhile, at the Oval Office, the Sovereign sits across from the President of the United States, reading over the prepared statement on Amazons and Wonder Woman as a whole. Your speechwriters invoke her name too often. It would be better to limit as much as possible. Better, perhaps, even to leave it out altogether. The Sovereign says, but the President disagrees, believing that it is best to talk about Diana, Wonder Woman, directly. The Sovereign looks over his glasses at the President. You might be forgiven for thinking these are suggestions, but we are here merely to assist in your running of our country. However, to forgive is not to concede. We are the King of the United States. We do not assist. We command. The Sovereign says, standing and glaring at the President, who nods his head, getting up, kneeling before the King, kissing the ring. A sign of penance before the rightful ruler of the country. Meanwhile, at the headquarters of Axe, Steele sits enjoying a drink with Amanda Waller staring out over the city. She's finally had enough. Soldiers won't be enough. The time of humoring her is done. After this, after tonight, we activate the list. You're to fetch them yourself. Waller explains, and Steele is shocked, taking another sip of his drink, nonchalant in his surprise. But Waller snatches the drink out of his hand. Get your freaking hand back! You're going to need it! Meanwhile, back with the young boy. He's scared. But Diana eventually convinces him to take a ride in the invisible jet like he always wanted. They leave the parents behind as she flies him high up in the sky. Jack is terrified, and he closes his eyes. We do not have to do this. Diana reminds him, but Jack shakes his head. He knows that he's going to die soon, and he wants to do this before he does. Diana nods, flipping a switch. Jack, open your eyes. The young boy opens them and looks down, and he knows that he's flying in the jet, but he can't see anything but the world far below him. Holy crap! He shouts in joy. The day continues, and Jack wants to see paradise. 
And though Diana knows it will be an issue, she gives the boy his last wish, landing them on the beach of Themyscira, where they are met by a detachment of Amazon warriors who order Diana to leave at once. But she shakes her head. No, thank you, she says quietly, as Jack holds onto her side and Diana speaks. The child is sick. He has made it his desire to visit here, only for a day. I will not say no to him, so please leave us to our wants and I will pay you the same courtesy. Diana says to the warriors who finally relent and Diana and Jack are left to themselves for the day. She allows the child some joy, teaching him to use a sword, allowing him to throw her tiara and ride a kangaroo to see the great griffins on the island. As the sun sets on it, the pair return to the invisible jet and prepare to depart. Meanwhile, the president's speech goes out to the world, condemning Wonder Woman's actions that led to the suicide of Private Delgado. The country turns against Wonder Woman and still prepares for the coming battle. And there you have it, the first four issues of Wonder Woman. Who's this villain? I don't know yet. The King of America? Sounds interesting. And if you want to know more, like, subscribe, and let me know in the comments down below. Damn, Benny, this is a good story, and I want to see more of it. I'll see you next time right here.